<laughs> Nobody cared who I was until I got the N word pass. <laughs> <laughs> we better have gotten that. Yeah, that was okay. Good. I was like, I hope we're rolling. Yes. That's... We had we had just rolled. <laughs> One cold open. <laughs> uh, at least it's there for posterity. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, people have at least a cursory understanding of meme language. Hopefully. I mean, at this point, to know that all three of the people that point. listen to our podcast have enough or don't question it at this point, Faith. Yeah. <laughs> Faith of all people should know not to question. <laughs> Us in particular. Yes. <sighs> Strong. Strong. <laughs> what the meme man? I, I I was watching a video recently where somebody had done a Minecraft mod where all the villagers' heads were the meme man heads. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Sure. <laughs> it was just like, oh, what is this huh. abomination? I like it. I like, like it. Really they solve the huh with like stonks. Stonks. <laughs> <laughs> I think there might have been like banners in like the different oh, houses oh. with like the meme man. Sure. And when when there's uh, mobs nearby, they do the panic thing where they they put their hands up to their head and they're like <laughs> panic. <laughs> I said no more vegetal. Angry vegetal. The uh, what was the name of that channel that had like meme man versus uh versus orang for uh trying to find the octahedron of transcendence. Bagel Boy? Was that Bagel Boy? Maybe it was. I don't know. It sounds like a Bagel Boy sort of thing. Hmm. It's been too long since we had dank memes. Yeah. It's been too hmm. long since we've it's been... solved the world's problems in the Newman Center apartment way too late at night. While Ben just watches random meme videos. Yeah. I wasn't there for that, I don't think. Well, the the time where you were here and the time where Ben was also here is a very minimal overlap. Yeah, it was ben like about a month. Is like the Ben diagram. The Ben <laughs> diagram <laughs> of our time here. Uh, <laughs> this is Ben's Venn diagram. It's like normal things people do, weird things Ben does. Yes, absolutely no intersection. Yeah, two distinct, two distinct circles. circles, completely different colors. <laughs> And yet they are still contained somehow in the same person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's so hard to do that without like smacking the, the table, the, like messing up the microphone. Table. Why should I leave all the kids up on the table? Table, 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 table. You wanted to. Wake up! System of a Down is like, it's very aggressive rock, but not like angry aggressive. It's just like, nah! It's just loud. <laughs> it's just like flailing your arms. Like, like your, like, like your Kermit, Kermit the Frog. The frog. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, angels deserve to die! When, when angels deserve to die! <laughs> Mother! <laughs> Although, let's face it, that's more of a Gonzo song. Yeah. I could see Gonzo doing. Re reciting, doing chop reciting it, like, um, it, while, I don't know, juggling a flaming bowling ball. Yeah. Chop suey, but it's Banjo Kazooie. <laughs> that oh, yeah. is one of the best. <laughs> yeah. Wake up! Yeah. Uh, Mems. Mems. The other one that was good was uh, um, All I Want, I think, by Foo Fighters. But it's the Pokemon theme song. Oh. Superimpose. I forget. All I, I Want is to be the very best, like no one ever was. Well, like, it was the it's vocals. It's the, the instrumentals from... From the Pokemon. From the, oh. Yeah. Oh. Instrumentals from Pokemon or instrumentals from instrumentals Foo Fighters? Instrumentals from Pokemon. Okay, and then, and then Foo Fighters lyrics. Yeah. Okay. okay. 
All right. Interesting. <coughs> Sometimes think... that really works. Sometimes it doesn't when you... There's a lot of um, Neil Ciciarga. Neil Ciceriga? C- Ciceriga, yeah, however you say that. I, I really like his mashups. They are always pretty clean. You know how there's some there's some patterns that like a computer like with a camera something will look at and it can't interpret what the heck is going on here for me that's some words where i'll just look at that and i'm like i have no idea how to even say that in my head so as in when you see them written down yeah oh. like say sort of good yeah right it's like you just you did that guy the uh, acbc guy neil c yeah <laughs> that dude some, I mean, even even his are some of them are kind of hit or miss, but the but the ones that hit are really they good. They hit hard. Yeah, there's a uh, smells like Billy Jean spirit. Yes, bills like Jean spirit. Bills like Jean spirit. That one yeah. I like a lot. <laughs> it was the mashup of uh, not even no, it's not a mashup. It's like the the uh, lyric instrumental swap with a uh, Billy Jean and uh, smells like Teen Spirit. Yeah, by Michael Jackson and Nirvana respectively. Mm-hmm. Fun stuff. There's some good. The, uh, ultimately, the, the the best one has got to be ACBC. 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 Yeah, it's fantastic. Which his original video apparently got taken down, but then somebody else uploaded it, so yeah, it's still on YouTube sure. if you want to listen to it. But I love how many times I've like, like people are in a group and then like playing music on a Bluetooth speaker or something, just kind of chatting, and I'll just like slip that one into the playlist and watch people's <laughs> and reactions. Everyone like, is weirded out. Yeah, it's like, oh, I like this song, and then like. <laughs> I'm, it's not what I expected, but I'm not, I'm not sure if I like it. Put that everybody. Just, <laughs> and everybody just slowly turns and looks at you, just like why? It's like because. Some men just want to watch the world burn. Some men just want to watch Michael Caine talk about the world burning. And I'll, I'll fight you. See, that's something we'll have to chat about in the near futures. The, uh, the Dark Knight trilogy? Yeah. The Nolan. Or Batman in general. The Nolans. Well, I don't know. Batman by itself is like, we could spend several, uh, episodes. several episodes mm-hmm. on just Batman. But the, 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 the trilogy, the Dark Knight trilogy, would be an episode of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah we will probably do the... Um, Rocksteady games at some point because those Ooh, are the Arkham games. Yeah. yeah, you should play those, James. Oh yeah, I have them on the Yim. Okay, so and they are believe... there for you to use. Don't you have one right. on Xbox too? I have two on Xbox. I Actually, have I have three on Xbox. Okay, and I have one on Wii U. I Which have I have neat. Arkham City, I have Arkham Origins, and I have Arkham Knight on console. Because yeah, those ones have like the. But classic. James likes his keyboard, so. I yeah. I've only played Arkham Asylum and Arkham City. Both are great, and sli- but for like little slightly different reasons. Mm-hmm. I think the first one's a really tight, condensed. Sort yes, of thing. it's very very. It's not as explorey and it's open worldy. Open-worldy. It's almost Metroidvania. Yeah, it's. It, it's like platforming, but not. I've, I've, it's, you grapple hook around yes. and like glide and around. Grapple like not, hooking and gliding are so it's pseudo platform. Yeah, right? yes. but like also, what, yeah. I've heard like the combat's kind of a lot of dodge and whack type. Well, it's the it's very kind of simplistic. It's very, but also, it's, yeah, it's very, they put you in scenarios a lot of the time where you have to be strategic. Sure, and like uh, sneak around on the gargoyles overhead, then drop down and grab a guy, and then. Yeah, there's they've got guns, and you can't fight guns. There's so, two different sorts of like combat yeah. se- scenarios in the game. There's one that's like a stealth based, take one guy out at a time, and then there's like a fifty dudes in a pile that you have to beat up, mm-hmm. and they operate very differently in terms of how you. So I suppose it's probably it. similar to the way the new Spider-Man PS4 is set up. By the looks, of I it. think I think comparisons have been drawn between that combat system and Batman. Which for a good sense. reason, because Batman did a pretty good job. A little simplistic, but fun mm-hmm. stuff. I'll have to give that a go. I should have, when I came home this weekend, I should have brought uh, Spider-Man 2 for GameCube. Because that's oh, a fun yeah. time. The, I wonder what that would look like on our TV. I mean, like a, probably like a GameCube like game? A, like a GameCube game. Yeah. I mean, it probably hasn't aged terribly well, but it also 
like graphically speaking. That I don't is. know when was the last time I like saw or like played a GameCube game on like a tube TV because that that's like what those were made for. Uh, yes, they were designed around a CRT. Mm-hmm. And if you're a Smash player, you carry a CRT wherever you go. Yeah. Because there's a uh, some games where they were where like they don't hold up. Well, obviously, graphically speaking, on like newer TVs, they don't hold up as well because they were never made for that. But it's also easier to uh, kind of look past the imperfections on a, the screen it was designed for. If we can figure out how to get our N64 to work with the TV, it'd be crazy to see like Super Mario 64. If we had it. If Yeah. I mean, that's another I have been trying to get my hands on it forever. Oh, man. I suppose, yeah, at this point, that's got to be very difficult to get your hands on for a decent price. Yeah. Um, the games I've played on N64 were like, uh, Mario Kart, uh, and then GoldenEye were like the two that I remember off the top of my head. Those are the two that everyone had when they got it in college, so. <laughs> yeah, because one of my brother's friends, and this is before I would, I would like spend, before I came to college, I'd spend like weekends out here and hang out with them. He had like the original box set and everything mm-hmm. for his N64, um, and like the GoldenEye um multiplayer was uh, i think it was like kind of one of the first of its kind pretty like, much on console anyway yeah it was the best console shooter until halo happened yeah like big head mode <laughs> all the cheat codes and stuff yeah and then you have like the paintball mode you were basically or something. invincible invincible if you played a zod job mm-hmm. all those all those fun things it's really janky to figure out but once like the key is like fig- getting the hang of it before everybody else does <laughs> <laughs> at least when i was playing it that was the case but but yeah i've seen i've watched people play mario 64 but i've never done so myself i i have played a bit uh my brother-in-law kind of loan gave us his 64 and mario 64 so my how to in- beat mario in half an a press <laughs> <laughs> but those like speed runs are kind of ridiculous yes. <laughs> And just, like, backwards long jumps and stuff. <laughs> it's just like, man. So crazy. The amount of game theory knowledge and stuff that it would take to figure this crap out. And exploiting glitches to make it happen and all that crap. It's just like, what are you doing? I mean, good for you, but what are you doing? <laughs> Speed running is just... Such a weird thing. Yeah. I can see, like, if it's a game like, say, Breath of the Wild, where you want to see how quickly you can beat Ganon just from start to finish. Like, something like that. Well, the, where but, you're within the bounds of the game. Right. Trying to speedrun yeah, it. I, I like, and, I like exploit-free speedruns. Those yeah, are yeah. much more fun to me. Because mm-hmm. it's like, well, sure, if you want to finish a 40-hour mission campaign in 12 minutes with yeah. glitching yourself through like, it. Like warping it by pulling the right item out of your pocket in the right spot and then walking through the right door. Yeah. Or if it's a Bethesda game, just, just... doing anything. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there was a, in the early versions of Skyrim there was a glitch where you could get underneath the the first big town you get to mm-hmm. and there was just this chest on in out of bounds just sitting there. It was like they intended for you to do it. <laughs> it's just below the what city. Was in there? Just it was some decent stuff, like like there was actually- upgrades for where you were as far as you had progressed. But there's just a chest down there. It's like you I'm totally. Like you're like we cannot patch this bug, so we're just gonna fo- put a freaking chest down here and <laughs> reward them for finding it if they find it. <laughs> it's, just, it's like what is this doing? It went from glitch to Easter egg. <laughs> this is a feature. This is intended. <laughs> yes, we meant to do it. Yes. Well, Skyrim is a game involving fantasy worlds, adventures, and treasure, right? Yes, it is. You yes, know what else is. is a fantasy world involves treasure and adventure? And dragons. And dragons. And dragons. The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien, in fact. And that is the topic of our episode for today. We are the Palladium Papists. I am James. I am Nathan. And I'm Riley. And you thought we were going to talk about Skyrim for a second. And the weather. Because we we talked a lot about... We are probably going to have to cover Skyrim. After more of us have played it. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Because one third of us has played it at this point. Yeah. (laughs) 
So The Hobbit, yeah, it's a novel written by J.R.R. Tolkien about a, a hobbit. Wow, who'd have guessed? Named Bilbo Baggins, and he lives in his nice, Bilbo comfy... Baggins. He's a well-to-do hobbit who lives in this nice, comfy little hobbit hole called Bag End in Hobbiton, in the Shire. And one day, a wizard shows up at his door and asks him if he wants to go on an adventure. And after a lot of good morning debate, he's like, nah, sorry, leave me alone. So Gandalf does the nice polite thing of leaving and then coming back with 13 dwarves and being like, we're going to eat in your house now. Um, and sing about the Misty Mountains. Yes. And so and they... also sing about cleaning up after ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> they, it turns out that their home, which was the great mountain of Erebor, the dwarves had this magic, like near magical kingdom under the mountain where they would just... Mind the earth for its riches and gobs like, of money. Gobs just, of money, ridiculously rich, jewels, gold, up the wazoo, or whatever the Lord of the Rings equivalent of the well, middle of earth. the wazoo is. Yeah, <laughs> the the Anduin or whatever, and uh, they uh, a dragon named Smaug the Terrible had descended upon their mountain. Airborne fire bee. Yeah, <laughs> um, and absolutely with his claws like meat hooks decimated their home and the nearby men's city uh it is taking all of my willpower not to say it <laughs> stay strong right i will <laughs> i will cheese knife and uh cheese knife. <laughs> um anyway so smog had descended upon their mountain and like driven them out killed a lot of people because dragons have this thing for gold right so ever since the dwarves have been in exile and so they're like all right we're, uh, we, 13 dwarves, are going to try to go in there and, like, just kind of gradually steal stuff bit by bit. Um, so, they're like, Bill, hobbits are known for their, how quiet they are. Um, just their ability to not be noticed. Yeah. They're rather small halflings who, yeah, they have big feet. And uh, they, in their opinion, everybody else is ridiculously loud because they just move about so quietly. Um, so Gandalf is like, hey, hobbits are nice and quiet and sneaky. Let's have him be our burglar. Um, so eventually they persuade Bilbo to come with them and make their, uh, through a series of adventures, like running into trolls um, and like stalling until they can, until like the daylight comes to turn them to stone. Um Meeting a guy who changes himself into a bear, flying around in, with the eagles. Funniest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> he turned himself to a bear. He turned himself into he a bear. He called himself the orc. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, going through the treacherous mist, uh, Mirkwood forest and all that fun stuff. Spiders. Spiders and elves and barrel riding and all this stuff. They eventually end up at the mountain. Bilbo starts doing his burglar stuff, um, but ultimately... With the thing that you skipped. Oh, yes. <laughs> Importantly, when they're in the Misty Mountains, the, he Bilbo gets separated from the group and runs into this weird creature. Um, not before stumbling on a ring he found in the darkness, though, which he mm -hmm. just kind of sticks in his pocket, doesn't think much of it. So Gollum, the creature he finds in this cave, wants to eat him, so they do a riddle battle. Um... <laughs> Uh, for Bilbo's life, and he wins by asking, by asking, asking a dumb riddle. By asking, by asking a dumb, a dumb riddle, riddle that what's he in didn't my pocket? Mean to be a riddle, it yeah. was just an exclamation. Like he, he forgot what he he forgot. He stuck the ring in his pocket, so he's just kind of fumbling around. Like, what what have I got in my pocket? And Gollum thinks that that is a riddle. So it's not fair. So he just goes for it, and uh, so he wins the riddle battle. But he find but Gollum. Riddle, rattle, biddle, battle. Yeah. Gollum is mad because his ring is missing. And he realizes that Bilbo, he's like, Bilbo stole it from us, as he would say. Or that Nasty Hobbit it stole, it, stole it from us. At any rate, um, turns out this ring is magical and you are invisible when you wear it. When you wear it. So Bilbo escapes... Yeah, and then uses the ring in certain situations. Being invisible is rather useful, including sneaking into the mountain when they eventually get there. Um, also, the leader of the dwarf group is Thorin, 
who was is the heir to like the he's like the next king under the mountain um so he's returning to his homeland but at any rate so they bilbo sneaks in there talks with the dragon um manages to make the dragon mad so he flies out of the mountain when it goes and attacks the local city of men and it, he's killed and then everybody's like oh look at that the dragon's dead there's all this gold in this that there hill let's uh so the elves want it the dwarves want it and the men want it and so they're about ready to have this kind of scuffle over it at the foot of the mountain and then gandalf is telling them all to shut up and quit doing being a dumb don't do it dumb and uh orcs show up show up yeah because they want also want the stuff Orps. and eventually eagles show up so there's these five armies all smacking so the dwarves everybody unites against the orcs and they have this big battle bilbo gets clocked in the head so he doesn't he's not there for much of it um thorin dies but the mountain's free and eventually they return home and well, bilbo's Bilbo got this ring home. Yeah, that is a grossly oversimplified plot, but um, obviously, I imagine most of the people listening to this have probably read The Hobbit. It was written more, compared to Lord of the Rings, it's more of a children's book, I think is the way mm-hmm. Tolkien intended it to be written. Yes. It is a lot more fantasy and uh, lighthearted adventure, right? Mm-hmm. There's no like real stakes for the most part other than bilbo's survival. right other than their survival but there's no like end of the world calamity mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they uh yeah so it's a much easier read than lord of the rings are mm-hmm. and obviously we skipped over a lot of stuff but right um the main theme of the book <laughs> is little guys can do big things too <laughs> to quote bit. veggie tales <laughs> um they uh hobbits the way tolkien's written them obviously okay this is gonna be like really awkward the haphazard way if you want to listen to real deep analysis of tolkien there's tea with tolkien or any number of books on the subject but at any rate so one of the main themes of the book yeah is, is bilbo you know like how, how like the quiet unassuming people are actually some of the most important ones in the world um, because if, if it wasn't for them, like doing the little things, then the big things wouldn't be nearly as important. And so here you have a little guy doing little things, but that just kind of shake up the world. Like he manages to make a dragon mad, um, find a ring, which is magical. And we find out later is very, 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 very important and powerful, but, um, and also kind of grows. Does that happen in the course of the Hobbit? I don't remember. What's that? Like that we found out. No. What the, the we just know the ring is magical in the Hobbit. Yeah. It's it's a handy little gadget he has in his tool belt, but like mm-hmm. nothing more. Gandalf than that. is like, eh, keep an eye on that thing. Rings, magical rings aren't common, so be careful with that. I think it's about the extent of it. Mm-hmm. Um. At any rate, so. I guess, yeah, what, I guess what are some other themes of the book? I feel like there's kind of two things. One thing, something that the dwarves learn from Bilbo and something the, that Bilbo learns from the dwarves. Mm-hmm. Where the dwarves and the Lonely Mountain and the dragon and the fight, the conflict over the gold is very, very gold-centric, right? Mm-hmm. They're all kind of, everyone involved in the whole thing has this greed about them yeah right? especially like especially exemplified in thorin the leader right so but bilbo kind of doesn't care yeah he is much more the the desires of his heart are more for his home and his comfort and his peace and quiet, peace and quiet. And good green earth right the the simple things in his simple life in the shire mm-hmm. right so the dwarves kind of have this you know this lust for treasure and power and gold, and so do the so does the dragon, the orcs, the men, the elves, as well as like a desire for revenge on this dragon right. that ruined their lives. And so I think one of the things that over the course of the book that the dwarves learn from Bilbo is maybe that uh, is the uh, the appreciation of the simple things. I feel like yeah. Where on the other end, Bilbo 
is a very, very complacent and happy to just sit in his hole mm-hmm. and not bother anybody and have nobody bother him. Yeah. But it pays to be bothered and it pays to help people. Yeah. He, he learns to reach out and grow and meet people and do things and and also like the strength that is within him to do right great things when necessary you can't do great things from a hole no you have to leave the hole to to do things Mm -hmm. and so he he they kind of dangerous thing going out your door so that's kind of bilbo's arc he goes from being not caring to caring yeah and the dwarves go from caring about gold to caring about people. Yeah, the uh, it's at first it's kind of it's kind of funny. Like the dwarves kind of see him as like almost a piece of baggage or something. Like he's just kind of a burden mm-hmm. to them. Gandalf was like the one that wanted him on the trip, but like they're like arguing over like who is in charge of keeping track of the Hobbit. Like when Bilbo gets lost, and like Dory gets stuck with him on his shoulders most of the time. Yeah, it's like being carried because even though the dwarves aren't that tall themselves, Bilbo's even shorter than the dwarves so they have to kind of keep an eye on them that way but by the time they get to the forest there's a real respect for bilbo Mm -hmm. and he's kind of assumed a leadership or second in command role almost yeah default yeah and uh especially like once he starts doing the thing he came along to do and in Mm -hmm. uh sneaking into the mountain and stuff and like kind of grabbing things here and there um he's sort of one like this very important jewel to the dwarves is this gem this great gem called the arkenstone the heart of the mountain the heart of the mountain he sort of finds that and that's another thing he he just likes to find super important things and just shove them in his pocket so he finds the arkenstone while on the mountain the dwarves have never mentioned it to him and so he's just like oh, okay i'll just stick this in my pocket Ooh, shiny it's shiny yeah eventually he's like oh that was very important and thorin is very very put out that they haven't found that yet but he sort of uses his wit to kind of help the dwarves see past their folly because, like, the men and the elves are like, hey, we want some of that gold there. Right, because the, the men are all like, hey, we killed the dragon and he blew up our town. Can we get some compensation, please? Mm-hmm. And the elves are and like, hey, like hey, no. The elves are like, hey, there's a couple of our things in that mountain. Could we have some of that uh, their gold stuff? And Thorin's like, no, it's my gold because I'm I'm the, the king under the mountain. So Bilbo kind of uses his wit to, like do diplomacies and he uh he, he gives them a the arc he gives the, the elven king the arkenstone like the, uses a bargaining chip yeah try to which gets thorin very mad at him he mm-hmm. gets very cross but yeah thorin was very cross <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so those are some of the things that uh bilbo brought to the table in the books in the book one book just tea, thank you mm-hmm. uh i guess what are you guys some, some of you guys uh favorite moments in the in the, in the hobbit book it's been quite some time since i read it it, it has been a while i read it multiple times and then i just haven't read it for years i think it was like early in high school the last time i read it mm. so it's a pretty yeah. easy read i forget one thing if, i think is kind of funny i might have a copy. lord of the rings is the depiction of the elves. Hmm. Because in Lord of the Rings, the elves are very somber and serious, and we're going to the Grey Havens because the world is dying. Mm -hmm. In The Hobbit, they go to Rivendell, and the elves are this cheerful bunch of lads. Mm -hmm. They're, like, singing and greeting them and just having a jolly good time picking on the dwarves and hanging out in the trees. It's... Kind of a weird juxtaposition. Yeah. I realize Lord of the Rings was fleshed out more by the time he got to. Um, yeah. Uh, but And, and thematically, Lord, it, it follows, like, with the way Lord of the Rings was written. Right. But I, th- I think, like, there's some odd things, like the trolls talking and complaining and debating mm-hmm. whether they squash them into jelly or roast them over a fire. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, like, the, the everything talks in this yeah. book. The spiders talk. The, 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 the orcs the trolls and goblins wallet. talk. Or no, the, the tro- troll's the, purse. Yeah, the troll's coin purse talks when he tries to steal it. <laughs> I forgot about that detail. I was like, what? So it's, <laughs> it's a lot more fantastical. Yeah. It's as if the man that went on the adventure was writing an exaggerated version of the story. Yeah. Which is 
in universe what happens. Uh, yeah. Bilbo goes and writes a memoir there and back again, yeah. A Hobbit's Tale, uh, which is basically the story of The Hobbit. Mm-hmm. So it's almost as if the exact details of what happens in the book of The Hobbit are, a little are more like what he wrote. There's a, there's a couple of little things in there, too, like um, Bilbo's great ancestor, who uh, was tall enough to fit on a real horse and fought goblins and knocked one's head off into a gopher hole, and that's how golf was invented. Like little things <laughs> like that. Yep. <laughs> there's a bunch of little fun moments like that. Um, it's it's a pretty easy read from what I remember. It's not, I mean, maybe a little more advanced compared to a lot of things kids read these days. I don't know, but um, but yeah, it's 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 pretty. It's not that long. Um, I don't know. I forget how many pages it is, but maybe it depends on the edition, like size of print and whatnot. But um, but it's 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 it's. it's it's short enough where it didn't need three movies. I'll say that. Yes, that's kind of that's kind of the point I'm getting at. So, having discussed the merits of the book, uh, let's talk about the movies. And they're not all bad. No, the first one, especially, an unexpected journey, was pretty good. It more or less was beat for beat what the first part of the book was, plus a whole bunch of a little bit of exp- a little more exposition. Well, and some stuff that you can't do in a book, like actually singing. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's there's the like, phrases and stuff, but like... Yeah, that was another thing, like, with Tolkien was, like, the music. Yeah, there's, like, the songs poems. In, in poems and stuff. Mm-hmm. Whole bunch of whole bunch of riddles. Yeah, and that carried into Lord of the Rings, too. You just don't see it. A little bit. It's, nearly as it's much more infrequently. I mean, they have songs in Elvish about Baron and Luthien that he yep. sings. Yeah, Luthien. Mm-hmm. Luthien. Luthien. See the, the thing. Spanish elf. We were we were we were watching. This is off topic, but we were watching the first half of the Fellowship last last night as we were recording this, or like as we were recording as it, of last the night. night of recording. It was yes. last night. Yes, that's what I meant to say. Anyway, um, it's it's funny how like you're trying to understand some of the things that Aragorn says. It's like far the way, what? That's why I would have been like anyway. Um. So the first Hobbit film, An Unexpected Journey, was pretty good. It left off... I mean, it, embell- it embellished things a little bit, but everything... A little bit might be being nice. Well, I mean... Radagast the Brown. Radagast... Okay, so there's things from... <laughs> not only is there the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, but you also have the appendixes that go with Lord of the Rings, which is all this additional information about the Middle-earth universe. You have the Books of Unfinished Tales, which eventually became... Or compiled into the Silmarillion, so there's all this other background stuff that happened to be going on in the in the Middle Earth world at the time of the Hobbit, all of which Tolkien hadn't written yet. So, um, and a lot of it, his son Christopher published after Tolkien died. Um, so, the movies, I think there was a little bit of it was justified in putting some of those things in the background right particularly the stuff that gandalf does because he yeah he dips halfway through the book for like he's the like, majority peace. of it yeah and he what's he doing well apparently he's investigating the like, the necromancer in the woods that's actually just sauron starting to come back yeah so some of the to, to a degree it's okay right um, so there's, there's there's showing what's going on in the background i guess and the movies were sort of made to be prequels of lord of the rings um so the first movie is is pretty all right um the main problem i have with it and this is like with the whole series in general the whole hobbit trilogy specific yeah um is uh the whole azog thing yeah like the the pale orc why they mentioned him in the book when they were talking about like reclaiming uh like so this uh, is going kind of deep in lore but years and we years, are loreful podcast. Yes, <clears throat> years and years before um, before the events of the Hobbit, because dwarves live a long time. Um, there's th- there was this um, there was another great under the under the misty mountains dwarven kingdom of more in the mines of Moria, mm-hmm. which was over under Moria! goblins and orcs and all sorts of crazy creatures that took it over, and so the dwarves fought this war to take it back. Right. And so the leader of the orcs at that time, 
again, years and years and years before the events of The Hobbit, was Azog. Mm -hmm. He was killed in the course of those events. By by Thorin. By... No, by it was Dane Ironfoot killed him. I thought he killed Dane Ironfoot and then no. Thor killed Thorin. Dane, Dane, Ironfo uh, Dane Ironfoot anyway. was another dwarf. He, anyway. Azog died, and actually the main antagonist at the end of The, the Hobbit is, is Bolg, Bolg his who son, is Azog's son. Who's seeking revenge. We don't know how orcs have kids, but that's... Don't question it. Yeah, don't think about it. Um... That's never really explained. Whereas in the movies, they, they just make have this Azog. subplot into, well, Azog survived and now he's chasing them because he's like this big... they need a chase sequence on a rabbit sled yeah. within the first 40 minutes of the movie. Yeah, there's this whole chase thing. It's like, we, I don't think we really needed there to be an, like a primary antagonist, but you do, you Peter Jackson. I mean, there was a primary antagonist. He was Smaug. Yeah. And... Yeah, we, we didn't need another orc antagonist person. No. But... Yeah, anyway, we didn't really need an explanation for why orcs were just evil creatures roaming the lands because they're just evil creatures because roaming the lands. Because of mythical story convention, As far right? as the movie's concerned. Um, but that was really the only problem I have with the first one. Second one, Desolation of Smaug, that is a doozy. Filler. Yes. Just, just a I bunch mean, of filler. The main quest line where they go to, like, Bayorn's house this guy who's a skin changer he can change from a man into a bear and he has all these kind of crazy like horses and giant bees and different things that hang out at his Bees. house um he's very like a man of the earth kind of thing so bilbo kind of relates to him in a lot of ways um and then they go through the um forest of mirkwood and stuff a lot of that is lifted right out of the book that stuff's fine um However, they add all sorts of crap, like an entire character um, who is in... And they also... Legolas was a character Tolkien made up after writing Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Um, he, who he is the, the son character. of the Elf King in Mirkwood. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that he would be in there. But why? There's another character, Tariel, the Elf Lady, played by Evangeline Lilly, who is absolute dead weight. I mean, the role she plays isn't entirely unprecedented in the uh, Tolkien lore. It is a very, it is an archetype of that Baron and Luthien and Aragorn and... But that uh, was between Ar elves Arwen and men. Have. There is nothing to indicate dwarves and elves ever being an item. True, true. But it's like... She falls in love with the youngest dwarf, Keeley, which makes zero sense. It's... It's a Hollywood movie. We must it, have romance. It didn't need to be. We there. must have kissing in our movies. It didn't need to be there. No, it didn't. And Honestly, it the didn't movie need to be three movies. You could have done it in two. Yeah, could have done it in one and a half. Yeah, um, the rest of it, where you know you have um, Bilbo talking to Smaug, who is oh, that voiced was by Benedict Cumberbatch. All that stuff was great. Even the, some of the stuff in Lake Town was pretty faithful to the way the book wrote it. There was a lot of extra politics and random stuff in there, mm -hmm. but yeah. Um, and then also background stuff happening that Gandalf's doing, like going to the Fortress of Dol Guldur and discovering that Sauron and hiding and all that fun stuff. Which again, if we're making this as a prequel to The Lord of the Rings, is an important piece. Yeah, that is fine. Um, and then you go into the Battle of Five Armies, which is the final movie. And the Battle of Five Armies happens. That's like all. That <laughs> That's like the majority of the movie, which they, Peter Jackson being Peter Jackson, throws like a bunch of stuff in there. Um, and Bolg is still a thing. Yes, but he's as like well Legolas's Astrolog. mini antagonist, and Legolas does. He's like the mini boss. That crazy that Mario stones. acrobatics on falling stones. Uh, it's it. There's there's some shenanigans that happen in this movie. Well, you t make a battle take up half the film. You've got to pad it. Yeah. <laughs> or you could just... Okay. And it barely lasts a few pages in the book, the actual battle, just because mm -hmm. Bilbo yeah. gets knocked unconscious so soon. In all three films, there are some over-the-top CGI sequences that are just kind of like, okay, this is ridiculous. Which, mm -hmm. a couple times it works okay. But others, it's just like, okay, what... Why, like, that crazy scene with, like, Bomber, the fat dwarf, in a in, barrel, just, like, 
tumbling down this hill, taking out orcs left and right. Or even the escape from the goblins in the first movie when they're yeah. in the Misty Mountains. That took just a little too long. It was too long and a little too over the top. I feel like if they... There, there's a lot of places they could have pulled back and trimmed. and then just. But that's not how the Peter Jackson do. I don't think that's how the studio do. Yeah. I think there was more fingers in that pie than there was in The Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Lord of the Rings was very much almost a passion project mm -hmm. um, by comparison. So I guess it's kind of like we were talking about last week. What there are, in my opinion, there's some tweaks that would have made the films better. But what are they? Cutting 66% <clears throat> of it. Yeah. yeah. Two movies tops. I can see two movies being justified. You could have done it in one if you really felt like. Honestly, it would have been a bit rushed. I, I still need to show you guys the old Rankin Bass cartoon from the 70s. It's not perfect. No. And it does. There are some pacing issues like midway through. There's some obviously cut scenes. But it's pretty much all of The Hobbit in like 90 minutes of film. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of fun. It's let's. See, one of the problems I have with the the Hobbit live-action trilogy is it tries too hard to be Lord of the Rings and doesn't yeah. focus hard enough on being the Hobbit. Lord of the Rings is like well over a thousand page long book. The Hobbit is like not even half that. Right. In terms of content. So the this Hobbit cartoon from the 70s is a lot more lighthearted, a lot more silly, a lot more just kind of fun and a little bit dumb in places, but like... Mm -hmm. They've got all the the songs from the book, like, written and composed. There's, like, little mini musical numbers in there. Yeah. They've got... I don't know. It's just... it's. I feel like it's more faithful to the spirit of the original book as a bunch of, like, little fun misadventures than the live-action films are. They're mm -hmm. trying to be the new Lord of the Rings The trilogy, new epic adventure. Which... By the Lego kind of isn't. <laughs> which I, I did play the, I have I yeah, might I may or may not have them set up yes. in my room <laughs> play the unfinished Lego Hobbit game that was disappointing it's like why did you stop well, why I, I had to pay five bucks for DLC come on <laughs> yeah um so okay so am I here, here's what I think it would take to make the Hobbit movies good like make the Hobbit great again oh my gosh <laughs> Um, we need to build a wall and have the dwarves pay for it. <laughs> Make the orcs they've got pay money. for it. There's orcs, you know. You know they they've got some bad hombres over there. <laughs> um, yeah, cut out Azog. It's unnecessary. Cut out Tariel entirely as a character. Cut out half of what Legolas does. Three quarters of what Legolas yeah, does. Yeah, there's, there's just two movies. And compress it a little bit. The um, it's been a while since I've watched um, the Hobbit movies, but but like trim some of the over the top action sequences down into yeah. more succinct. You bits. can have the bit you know where they escape from being imprisoned by the elves, right? And, and have the barrel chase be fun. Sure, yeah. Just don't need not to as, have not a, as crazy. an orc ambush and other things in there. Yeah, it's just. In fact, actually, the the fact that it's a chase down the river reduces the cleverness of Bilbo's escape yeah. plan. Yeah. Because in the book, he orchestrates this clever little escape plan, and it flows without a hitch. Yeah. And they just... He, it brings... It gives Bilbo respect among the group. Mm -hmm. Even if they're kind of grumbling and complaining about how much it sucks to be in a barrel on a cold right. day. Right, but they can't deny that how effective it was, and they yeah. come to respect Bilbo as a clever and sneaky and talented mm -hmm. addition to the team. And that's, like, one of the biggest turning points for them. And to eliminate the dumb thing where, for some reason, Feely and Keeley couldn't come with because Keeley got shot with yeah, an arrow was to weird. the knee. All that weird stuff. So, yeah. I used to be a dwarf adventurer like you. Yeah. See, you then could I totally, took an arrow to the knee. Where, where the first Hobbit movie leaves off, where they've been rescued by the Eagles, I think is a good stopping point. Heck, you could actually let that roll a little longer if you trim everything else down. Yeah. Remove the, the bunny chase sequence, the Azog stuff. Oh, the, yeah. Reduce, the, reduce a bunch of scenes. Reduce the red against the brown. Because brown and... Brown, brown, brown. And then maybe have things happen like a little bit later. Like they have them getting to Lake Town in the first movie. Yeah. You could get to Lake Town in the first movie. 
Well, Cut Bjorn, maybe. He's not entirely necessary. I mean, he's kind of a fun part. It is a fun part. So maybe get them to Mirkwood or something. Yeah. Just definitely past the Eagles. Because you, you can fit more if you trim enough stuff down. We've got to get I this suppose. into, two, mov- into yeah. two movies also. So pick up... So pick up movie two, they're going into Mirkwood. Yeah. And then just have that through the end. Yeah. Because you can cut a whole bunch of orc chases and random romance subplots. And... Yeah. I think the way that the Smog's attack on Lake Town was well done. That was the other thing that was aggravating about the decimation, desolation of Smog. It was ends... like the it ends as Smog is about ready to bring down fire and death upon the city. That was a cool scene. I love it was fine. It was like and, okay, cliffhanger. Fair enough. I, I also running around in the in the mine, having the d- dragon chase them and then cover them in gold, but it doesn't work because that was random and kind of out of nowhere and doesn't need to happen. You don't need a random action. Let's show you all this CGI we can do with the dragon. We okay, the dragon was done. Well done, but yeah. Oh yes, I chasing him around. And Benedict Cumberbatch's performance as him was fantastic yeah because it's all mo-capped and all that oh, yeah. stuff and they like animated did, did the voice yeah they matched the voice to the face yeah it was funny it's because at the time him and martin freeman who played bilbo were also in the sherlock tv series so that was kind of fun but um and martin freeman did a good bilbo martin freeman did a very good job as bilbo um richard armitage was good as thorin and the other dwarves Thorin as the other Pikachu. dwarves <laughs> And the other dwarves were did a, had a good performances as the other dwarves, but they they were the just, other dwarves. for the most part that's kind of what they were the other dwarves yeah which you mean, in, I mean they had to be names. fair in the books they were kind of also just the other dwarves mm-hmm. there wasn't a whole lot of characterization outside of Thorin and Balin and maybe like one or two others mm-hmm. I mean Bombor's one character trait is being fat yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, there must uh, be a cake. Thorin, Balan Dwalin, Keely Feely, Dori Nori Ori, Oing Gloin, Biffer Bofer, and Bomber. Yeah. Gimli, Those are the 13. son of Gloin. Yeah, and Gloin is, is, is Gimli's dad. Yeah. Uh, from Lord of the Rings. But for the most part, they're just kind of the other dwarves. So, yeah, I think, I, I think the main problem the Hobbit has is, like, too much dead weight. Yeah. Because um, the good stuff they have is really solid. Mm-hmm. They could, I mean... I mean, it's the same creative team for the most part behind the Lord of the Rings. So you still have the awesome, like Weta team, who did like Attention all the, the character and the costumes design. and the props. The elves and stuff. were really cool because that was something we didn't really get to see much of in Lord of the Rings. Was like, I mean, some but not a whole lot. And the wood elves are the are the cooler ones anyway. Yeah, they're the ones that live rough and tumble. They're a little the edgier than the, the spiders and stuff. They're a little edgier than the uh, Rivendell elves. Um. Yeah, and then the dwarves. A lot of the uh, motifs and stuff of like their architecture and armor design and different things like that were really cool. I guess we're kind of going into the beauty of the the movies. Well, I mean, at, yeah, if we want to do our transcendental analysis. I mean, why not? The, yeah. So, I guess we need to talk about the Hobbit as a whole. Well, okay. Yes. Yes. So I guess we'll start with truth because we would be remiss if we didn't mention the fact in our discussion that Tolkien is was a very deeply Catholic writer, as I'm sure a lot of people know at this point, especially mm-hmm. if you listen to this podcast. Um, so, yeah, what are some truths that he very there, there's a lot of like spiritual truths and like transcendental stuff that he like buried in his writings? So, what are some truths within the story of The Hobbit? All of them at once, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you've got you got Thorin's story, right? Where yeah. his, his lust for treasure is actually his downfall, mm-hmm. right? His, the, the, the dragon spell over the gold, right? Kind of takes hold of him and yeah. claims him until the end and... It greed, uh, like sort of the warning against kind of a greed. cautionary tale against greed. Because that's also and, another thing about Bilbo is like as he comes back, he doesn't he he gets you know quite a bit of treasure and stuff from from but he, uh, he kind of doesn't his care. adventures, but he doesn't. He could have had one fourteenth of every single freaking thing in that mountain. But he just wanted but a little bit of gold. Grabbed they a couple stole ba- from the box, trolls. yeah, a couple boxes full and the ring. Yeah, 
which um, becomes transcendentally important so later. Like, but <laughs> we talked about earlier heroism and the little things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. What else? There's also a, a, a spirit of charity toward the end where after they come together after the Battle of Five Armies, right? Mm-hmm. The dwarves and the elves and the men all kind of cooperate mm-hmm. and share some of the prosperity of the mountain and of the area. And like help to rebuild help after to rebuild the, the destruction town of the and battle. Yeah. So yeah. there's at the end this kind of, well, that kind of feeds into unity, I suppose. Yeah, and restoration of like to so the former glory of the region. Mm-hmm. In cooperation with one another. Right. Um, so, yeah. Um, goodness. Kind of a lot of the same. And and Bilbo is a, is a kindly he sort stands, of He stands very much... He is, like, representing like the good little things. So, you know, he, the yeah. Shire is this very verdant, peaceful country full of very- simple folk who live off the land and are just all about the importance of like family and good food and just simple pleasures and just appreciating the beauty of, of nature, like creation. Um, where the dwarves are very industrial. They're very contemplative and leisurely people. Yes. Yes. The The hobbits are. are. Yes. The hobbits hobbits are. are. The dwarves are very materialistic. Mm -hmm. The dwarves are industrial and ambitious and build great monuments to themselves. So, okay. So you have the hobbits, which, uh, so you have the dwarves, which are kind of materialistic. Would you say that his elves are kind of spiritualistic? The, the Rivendell ones, I suppose. I don't. In I don't general, know that I would agree with that. Like the, some of them have the tendency to be. Of course, they also have a deep appreciation for creation as well. Yes, they are. <clears throat> I would say the sometimes elves, overly spiritualistic. Yeah, the elves are like an ancient race. To, to so the they point have, of, they're very contemplative, almost to the point where they get kind of stuck in their own heads. They're kind of prideful. Yeah. They they have the uh, a certain they look down on, on, the, on other races, mortal races a little bit, particularly dwarves. They don't get along with them well at all. No, they don't care for dwarves at all. Um, so I guess in that, where would men be? Like his race? Well, men are men. They're yeah, just, they're very yeah, much flawed. us with all of our problems very and all of our. They're just us without most of the good stuff most of the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They they're very archetypal mankind yeah you know they although you still have your uh, the heroism like you have um bard the bowman who takes down the dragon Mm -hmm. who is just sort of the simple guard who lives in the town beforehand and just happens to have a a black arrow that is specifically designed for killing well in the movie they made it like oh this is this MacGuffin that can kill dragons whereas like whereas Black in, in the in the book it was kind of just a family heirloom that came from the, the mountain arrow. back during its glory days S- slash his the favorite arrow. arrow specifically designed to kill dragons <laughs> dragons arrow <laughs> um so yeah uh, beauty there's uh well the books are very well obviously very well written they're a literary classic People sometimes complain about Tolkien's style of like liking to describe every blade of grass, but <coughs> people don't understand that Tolkien is building, discovering the world at the same time you are. Yeah, he's mm-hmm. like going out into this hill as he's walking up it, as he's writing it. He's like he's painting a picture for you, like a landscape that he is like experiencing himself as he like writes it, walk, <laughs> guiding you through it as he's. So he's like discovering this world and, and also bringing you to it. Reading it as a kid, it really like stoked my imagination, to be honest, like his writing style. Some people find it tedious, but I didn't. The other thing is he's mostly writing from the perspective of Bilbo. Yeah. So everything is very new and strange to him mm-hmm. in this great wide world. So as a reader going into the story, you're very much in Bilbo's shoes, where yeah, well, or lack thereof in this case, yeah. <laughs> in his where, place. where, yes, where, at, you're experiencing it as Bilbo experiences in persona, it. Bilbo, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> that 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 was about it. Where it's oh, like, okay, <laughs> but so, yeah, you're experiencing the strange new world on an adventure, right. And so the kind of magic and wonder that Bilbo experiences is kind is made present through the writing and the presentation of the mm-hmm. book. 
the films to their credit um they look nice yeah it's the same creative team behind the lord of the rings so that a lot of the stuff like we talked about earlier was very well done and for the most part with the exception of some over the top cgi it was it was a very well made film overall um yeah uh beauty there's other elements of beauty though like kind of like we talked touched on like um so the bilbo's appreciation for like you know the earth and like the simple pleasures and stuff it's like it's very contemplative of the beauty of those things Mm -hmm. and that like i think i think tolkien himself was kind of like i'm a hobbit like this is how i look at the world you know a Mm -hmm. good pipe some tea on the tea on the in the kettle on the stove and uh, a good fire and some good food and stuff and a nice armchair where I can do some reading. That you is know. to discredit the, the, the nice craftsmanship of the dwarves. No, or yeah. Any- the dwarves very much, their conception of beauty is very much through their craftsmanship and like their ability to make beautiful things out of gold and silver and carving out of stone and things like that. They're very industrious, and hardworking folk. It comes off looking pretty great. Mm-hmm. And I think the elves sort of relate more to the hobbits in that they're very, very centered on nature as well. To the point where, like, all of their structures are, like, built around and in and with trees almost. Yeah. Um, they sort of shape the and earth. And in Battle for Middle Earth 2, trees are the things that give you more food. <laughs> that let you build more army. That is a game I need to play. I you think. do. It's wonderful. Was that the one we looked up that was made by the same team that did Star Wars Battlefront, or was there something else? Uh, no, that was the Lord of the Rings Conquest, I believe, which was okay. like a first person, yeah, or not, not like a third person game. There was also a The Hobbit game for GameCube, made by Sierra Games. It was kind <clears throat> of a fun uh, action platformer thing, like mm-hmm. 3D platformer, where you're Bilbo and you use your walking stick to do like pole vault jumps and you use your sword and you whack spiders and you collect little pennies scattered about the land and you do little quests yeah. for the people and it it's it was fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of unrelated and off topic, but eh. Um Oh, I suppose the last thing being unity. How do we How is that expressed in the Hobbit? come together right now i suppose the whole narrative uh, uh, it, it's it, it's united in the fact that it's a fairy story sure it, it's sort of everything is it headed to ending. that point it is right that is the the focal point in the horizon that everything you know the running quest towards. and then is very clear and when... so do i yeah <laughs> Chapter by chapter, it's kind of episodic almost, where this is where they go to fight trolls. This is where they go meet the elves. This Mm -hmm. is where, I mean, it all follows through. Yeah, it's very seamless. But they, it's also very, like, very episodic, where they go to one place, do a thing on their way to their destination, and then move on to the next part. Yeah. I I would say it's unified in its... um desire to evoke the imagination and yeah, that mm-hmm. is what all of the components are there to do yeah mm-hmm. also like it's very you know it doesn't really s- s- wander stray from like the main quest that they're on no there stops um, along the way but they're ultimately they don't grind any xp on side quests yeah <laughs> like uh, that crap like gandalf like the does do. yeah gandalf is just off building xp <laughs> You'd think he'd be maxed out by now. No, yeah. no, no, no. He, he levels he, up after he beats the Balrog. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, 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 he, that, that. he gets a class upgrade. He gets a class change. <laughs> no, it's not a change. He's no, still a wizard. Um, He's just a yeah, better wizard. Better wizard. Yeah. And straightened hair. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> what, what kind of a bonus does that give? <laughs> Plus five new, accuracy. New staff. <laughs> new staff. New uh, Bed Bath & Beyond staff. <laughs> <laughs> all righty all righty that's about all i had to say about that very cool thank you for listening yeah to our ramblings once more if you wish others to also be listening to our ramblings <laughs> um 
introduce them to our podcast via Twitter or Facebook by following them and sharing our stuff. Or standing six feet away from them and turning it on high volume from your phone and just yes. blasting it into their ear hole. That works, too. Yes. He's six feet apart, of course. That's what of... John does to his roommates. <laughs> he, he makes, makes, them, us, listen he makes them listen to the podcast? Yeah, he just plays it. Nice. <laughs> nice. So, yeah, be like John. Be like John. <laughs> Although, well, we would get more listens if people listened to it individually. Yes, we would. But if, if you just want other people to know the But goodness. more people interested is also helpful. Yeah. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Palapapists. Do you, do you post anything on tr- Twitter? Yes. I, he posts that there are episodes. I do. I did share the okay. article as promised that I mentioned. Okay. Last I week. don't check Twitter, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, on Facebook as well. You don't check Facebook either, though. Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> I occasionally check the group chat and Facebook Messenger, but. Not to be too prideful, but I think we're, by default, one of the few things worth looking at on social media these days because everything else is just everything else is about coronavirus or minneapolis garbage. yeah yeah so if you want a break give our podcast a listen listen to us complain about the weather we've got <laughs> we didn't this time yes though. we will have to t- holler at tea with tolkien to see if she'll do a lord of the rings episode with us Ooh, crossover yeah that'd be kind of neat that would be neat she is far too big for, yeah. to care about us for little small, us. small fries but we, we can try so cast yeah. the line out there we can try i feel like we'd actually have to have show notes yeah well she could take care of it oh, sure, <laughs> That's sure. Her job. we just gotta tell her the formula and then uh-huh. we're good to let her in with it the palladium papers episode formula <laughs> <laughs> well, a million dollar they're after me formula <laughs> <laughs> On that note, Sponge Boys and me, Bob. Thank and you for listening. Sponge Boys and Girls. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for listening, and we will talk to you next week. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.